I feel less confusion. I feel more absolute determination and clarity. And the big change in my life is that I feel part of a democracy movement. And that did not, I didn't feel that way in 1971 or when I wrote Democracy's Edge uh, 10 years ago or so. So um, I'm more focused. I feel like I have allies. I feel like we have a shared vision. And I feel like we're making progress, although it's invisible to most people. Let's talk about what you mean by democracy. Does America really have democracy with a two-party system? Well, I'm with you. I'm with you. Um, I, it is certainly a profoundly flawed uh, journey still that we are on. I love to quote William Hasty, who was the first African-American appellate judge in the United States, and he said, democracy is not being, it is becoming. It is easily lost, but never finally won its essence is eternal struggle. And so I consider democracy not, not a destination, but a journey. And on that journey, we are in many ways in big retreat. So I'm with you on fundamentally saying that we can't just blithely say, well, we have democracy. And I would agree very much that that doesn't help us. So what I want to do is be better at defining. I mean, democracy is really having three fundamental foundational elements, and that is that power is widely dis diffused, it's not concentrated, and that it's fluid, so people can gain power who are powerless. And second, that transparency is the name of the game, that things are open instead of secretive, as now more than ever, so much happens behind closed doors. And the third condition is really a cultural norm the opposite of what we have today. It is the norm of mu mutual accountability. Uh, Reverend Heschel said, "We uh, some are guilty, but we're all responsible. And that's kind of the philosophy of my life, that if we're all connected, which we are, then we're all implicated in the crisis today. So those are the three conditions, the dispersion of power, transparency, and mutual accountability, where we know we're all on the hook. Uh, those are the conditions of democracy, and they are very much missing today. I, I often also quote <laughs> um, dear President Roosevelt. In 1938, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said to Congress, the liberty of democracy is not safe if the people tolerate the growth of private power to the point that it is stronger than the democratic state itself. That, it, in its essence, is fascism. Now, I don't use the F word except when quoting an American president. And Adam Eichel. Yeah, he's terrific, terrific. Tell me about how the collaboration began, because when I read this book, the new book, Daring Democracy, what is so crucial about it is the generational conversation. Well, it was a little magic in it. I think I, I listened to that pundit, uh, I think it was Woody Allen, who said... Uh, 90% of life is showing up, and so I showed up, and Adam showed up in Mexico City Airport on a rainy afternoon, and we were headed to the first global conference on money and politics. And huddling in the rain, we introduced ourselves to each other, started a conversation. That was September of 2015, and that conversation has never stopped. We are 49 years apart in age, and we agreed on every word of the book. <laughs> so I think uh, our friendship definitely flourished, definitely deepened as we marched together, as we acted together. We marched from Philadelphia to Washington, D.C. in April of 2016 as part of Democracy Spring. I participated in perhaps the largest sit-in on the Capitol steps. This was for democracy reforms. 1,300 of us were arrested. And that was a great time to talk. And we realized how deeply we were aligned. So I think, oh, and also I should mention on that march, there were elders like me and there were young people like Adam and everything in between. And he went to Vassar College, majored in politics there. And Adam had the good fortune of being on a campus where a group called Democracy Matters was present. And he became the president of the Democracy Matters chapter. And this is now an organization that has student groups on 40 plus campuses across the United States. Each campus group gets to decide what they want to do as long as it's focused on democracy. So it's there's not a top-down driven agenda. It's really focused on 
what locally and what on your campus can you do? How can you help educated your, educate your fellow students and help them get to the ballot box? It's funny, Adam and I were just at his alma mater, and I learned there that um, the campus is divided into three voting districts. So even college campuses now are gerrymandered, making it harder for people to vote. It was crazy. But that that so Adam then is absolutely passionate about all these issues as well. He spent a year in in Paris at an institute there studying exactly what you're talking about, European systems that offer many lessons for us, including the strong role of public financing elections and parliamentary systems, so more people are represented. And your own daughter, Anna, 15 years ago it was you set up the Small Planet Institute in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now, you and she inform each other, taking your work on, and it's a continuum. It was a process of learning together. Let me say first, she started editing my writing when she was in high school. So I knew she had a very good eye for language. And um, But the real shared experience was so deep. We ended up traveling the world together when she was 26. That's the age that I was when I wrote Diet for a Small Planet. We traveled on five continents, interviewing people that we thought of as pushing forward the edge of hope from the Nobel Prize winning Wangari Mathai in Kenya, whose group has now planted millions and millions of trees fighting deforestation in Africa. So we we really uh, shared that experience deeply. We went to Brazil and met the Landless Workers Movement, interviewed people, went out to encampments and got to see what it meant to be part of that Landless Workers Movement. So it was this joint learning, I think, that we still participate in that so changed both of our lives, actually, because I found, I think we both found that the most hopeful people on earth aren't the people who are privileged, but the people who are engaged with each other, tackling some of the most difficult challenges in the world. And so we learned a lot about hope, that it's what we do in action. It's not some stance we take toward life, but what we do with others. She's not just a mirror image. It's Francis Moore Lappé on steroids with uh, extra flourishes, perhaps. <laughs> yes, well, she's, she's really drawn and so effective in... Uh, really focusing on uh, the rights of farm workers, of farm laborers and, and food workers. That's a big part of her mission. And on very basic things like the role of corporations in leading to such travesties as the diabetes rate in the United States today. So one of her themes, she had a beautiful piece in the New York Times not too long ago about the impact of sugary drinks that are promoted to the poorest people in this country and create such a health crisis for them and people consuming them as well as the country as a whole because of the disease effect. And so she's championing, in fact, in Berkeley, California, where she and her family live, she's very active in the soda tax, uh, uh, adding a tiny tax, but it is shown to help reduce the consumption of these really deadly drinks. So she's brilliant organizer. I would say uh, it's one of the differences in us. She has a knack for organizing, and uh, she's focused very much on the corporate contribution to the crisis. And I remember this when I was uh, 15 when the book came out. A lot of people saw Diet for a Small Planet as a cookery book because there, that was one aspect of it. I saw it as a manifesto. You are an intensely political person. Do you agree or not? I agree. I totally agree. And, and I had the idea that, oh, if, if I could just share with people and convince people that the root of hunger was not the scarcity of food, but the scarcity of democracy, that they would... You know, realize, oh my God, we can't end hunger as long as we have the system that marginalizes most people and so tightly concentrates power and we begin to create a democratic economy. So yes, I have always been extremely political. I, I started out as a community organizer in a very poor section of Philadelphia during the war on poverty and everything really has come from those experiences of the 60s. So I'm very much a child of the 60s. <laughs>